Matthew chapter 8, we'll pick up here in verse 28 in a moment. Uh, as I mentioned last time, though, Matthew is out to prove to his fellow Jews that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. In chapters 8 and 9, he gives us 10 very unique, very different, very important miracles that Jesus performs. And he demonstrates the power, uniqueness of Christ. At the same time, he's also demonstrating the Father's heart of love and compassion and grace and mercy to the multitudes of people who have been following Jesus around at this point. Uh, we left off with Jesus and his disciples going through the crazy storm on the Sea of Galilee. Um, we saw that they went through this storm because they were obedient to the Lord. Remember, Jesus told them, and sometimes we think, what did I do wrong? Why am I going through this? And it's like, no, you might be right in the will of God, and you still go through it. So Jesus says, get in the boat. We're going to the other side of the sea, and they get in the boat. They're obedient, and then in the middle of it, they hit that windstorm. The waves are crashing on the boat. They're taking on water. Jesus is asleep, and they wake him up, and they're all frantic. Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? So he rebukes the wind and the waves, calms the sea, and then he says to his disciples, Oh, you of little faith. Why did he say that to him? Because they didn't believe his word. When he said, Get in the boat, we're going to the other side, that's the word of the Lord to them, and they thought we're going under. And so they didn't believe by faith what he said to them. Now, he simply rebukes the storm, he brings a great calm, and they wonder at the end of that, that section, who is this guy that even the wind and the waves, the sea, obey him? Well, it's interesting because now as we come into this section in chapter 8, uh, we find out who he is. And guess who tells us who he is? The demons. Interesting. So let's look at this. Chapter 8, verse 28. When they had come to the other side, again, Jesus promised we're going to the other side of the lake. They get there to the country of the Gergesenes. There met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. So these two demon-possessed men, they are in really bad shape. They're messed up. How messed up are they? Well, they're living in tombs. They were exceedingly fierce, but look at these verses in Mark chapter 5. It gives us a little more detail about one of these guys. Mark 5 verse 4 says, Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him, so he's like a wild beast, and he's just snapping chains when they try to chain him up. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So needless to say, these two guys have been really messed up. They're being destroyed by Satan. And this is what Satan would love to do with everybody in the world. He wants to destroy. Jesus said he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And without Christ, spiritually speaking, people are chained and shackled with sin, and they're being destroyed by the enemy. And these guys, they're living like animals. No friends, no family, but they are not, here's the key, they're not too far gone for Jesus. And we'll see that with some of these miracles that we look at this morning. Not too far gone for the Lord. Look at verse 29. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Again, the demons know exactly who Jesus is. They know he's the only begotten Son of God. They've known Jesus since they were created. When God created all the angels at the beginning of time, whenever that was, he created them. They all knew exactly who Jesus Christ is, who he was, and Lucifer and his rebellion, you can read about it in uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, when he rebels, he takes a third of the angels with him, that's these demons. So they know exactly who Jesus Christ is. James 2 verse 19 tells us, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So it's not enough just to say, oh, I believe in God. 
No, you have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. But why do the demons tremble? Because they know what their future is. They're going to end up in the lake of fire, separated from God for all of eternity because of their rebellion against the Lord. And when these demons ask Jesus, have you come here to torment us before the time? They're referring to that final judgment. First, they'll be thrown into the lake of, or the abyss, and then later into the lake of fire. This also lets us know what, uh, that they know they're no match for Jesus. All the demons and Satan himself, they're no match for the creator of the heavens and the earth, Jesus Christ, co-creator with the Father and the Holy Spirit. They can't stand against the Lord. Jesus could wipe them out instantly if he wanted to, and they know that. So make no mistake about it, as God, Jesus is infinitely more powerful than anything this world, the devil, Anything they throw at you, Jesus is in control. The, these demons are no match, and they recognize who he is. Now, it's at this same moment when they acknowledge who Jesus is, the Son of God, that the Gospels of Mark and Luke also record Jesus asking these demon-possessed men, what is your name? And they say, legion, for we are many. Now, the Roman term for legion, it means 6,000 soldiers. You know, you've heard that before. How many angels could be on the head of a pin? It doesn't matter. It's a stupid question. Some, you know, agnostics will throw at you. They're trying to trip you up. Well, how many demons can fit inside of a person? Well, we don't know, but there's a lot in these guys here. Check this out. It gets even more weird. And again, the disciples, they're thinking, this storm is weird. Jesus rebukes the storm and it gets calm. Now things go from weird to weirder with this. Look at verse 32. Now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Now the demons didn't perish, but the swine perished. Demons, you know, they were not bound up by water and all that. So you remember how many pigs got turned into deviled ham? Wow, uh, that's a sorry. <laughs> that's a lot of bacon, right? So two thousand pigs get demon possessed. How do we know that? Again, Mark chapter 5, verse 13, we're told about this scene. At once, Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. By the way, we know exactly where that is on the Sea of Galilee. It's the northeast side. There's only one place where it's steep. It's not a cliff, but it's a steep drop-off into the Sea of Galilee. And in that hillside, there are tombs still there, caves. So that's where it took place. Anyway, um, they are delivered, these two men. They're set free. The crazy thing is, as we'll now see, is the, the pig herders. What do you call pig herders? I don't know. These guys run back to the village and they tell everybody in, the, in their place what happened here. And here's the crazy thing. They get upset with Jesus. They get mad at him and they beg him to leave. Look at verse 33. Then those who kept them, the pigs, fled and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Look at this verse in Luke 8.35. It gives us a little more detail about one of these men. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Again, all the people, they begged Jesus to leave. 
I find this incredible for a couple of reasons. Earlier, the people were terrified of these demon-possessed men. They said they couldn't even pass by that road that went by them because they'd probably beat them up. They'd probably tear them up. And so they didn't even go that way. They were so afraid of these guys. They're like wild animals. But now that they're delivered, now that they're set free, and this guy is sitting at the feet of Jesus, he's wearing clothes, he's in his right mind, now they're terrified of Jesus, and they want him to leave. It seems that they have their priorities all messed up. Instead of saying, who's this wonderful person that just delivered these two men who are now in their right mind? They're like, hey, mister, why did you ruin our pig business? We want you out of here. You thought animal rights over human rights was a new thing? Nope. They were more concerned about the 2,000 pigs than they were about getting these two men saved and healed and delivered. That's their priorities, the pigs. But this is a good illustration of what Jesus has done for all of us and what he can do for anyone who has been messed up and what he can do for anyone who has been worked over by the world, by the flesh, by the devil. Again, nobody is too far gone for Jesus to reach and save and deliver. Some people have what they call life verses. Any of you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's like early on in your Christian life, you're reading the scriptures and like, wow, that's for me. This is my life verse and becomes part of your DNA as a Christian almost. Well, mine is Ephesians chapter 2, that whole chapter, but verses 1 through 7 specifically. Let's look at these verses here because this is what Christ has done for me. This is what he did for this guy. It says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. I don't know if you can relate, but that was me, just as the others. Here's the key. But God, two very important words, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus Here's the reason why, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So he, he saved you, and then throughout eternity, you're going to be like a trophy of his grace. This is what God's grace has done for you. This is what God's grace has done for this person here. And we're going to be like trophies of his grace because of what he has done with sinners like us, how he has saved us and changed us, just like he did with these two lost, desperate, demon-possessed men. Before we move into chapter 9, though, there's one more part of the story that I find very fascinating. As the people are begging Jesus to leave them and go away from them, uh, the former demon-possessed guy begs Jesus to allow him to go with Jesus. So look at these verses. Luke chapter 8, verse 38. It says, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him. That word begged is used three times in this section. You know, first the people beg him to leave, or the demons beg him to put him into the pigs. The people of the village say, they beg him to leave. Now, this guy begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. In the Gospel of Mark, it says, and how the Lord has had compassion on you. And then it goes on to say, and he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Here's why I find this interesting in a, couple of, in a couple of ways. Twice the demons beg him, don't put us in the pigs. And Jesus says, okay. You know, then all the townspeople beg him, leave us alone, go away from us. He says, okay. But here's the guy that gets saved, delivered, healed, set free, and he's begging Jesus, can I go with you? And he says, no. Interesting. Why is that? Because Jesus had a better plan for his life 
He commissions him to go back home, tell everybody what God has done for you, how God has saved you, how he has set you free. And in telling everybody what God has done, what does it say? He tells everybody what Jesus has done for him. This guy knows exactly who Jesus is as well. He is the only begotten Son of God. He is God come in human flesh. What an amazing testimony this guy had. From death to life, from darkness to light, from toil, uh, turmoil, uh, destruction to peace and joy and purpose for living. I can't wait to meet this guy in heaven. There's a lot of people I think we're going to get to spend eternity hanging out with people and hearing their testimony. And now I see why you're a trophy of God's grace. Can you imagine this guy? Wow. How many demons did you have in you? Oh, a couple thousand, I think. I don't know. It was crazy, but uh, it's amazing what God can do. Well, let's look at chapter 9. We'll get through a few verses here. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. So again, they're sailing back the north part of the Sea of Galilee. They come to his own city, which now we know is Capernaum or Capernaum. This is where Jesus had his headquarters there on the Sea of Galilee. And notice he is greeted, well, we'll see that he is greeted by a multitude of people. In one place, he is said, you know, leave us alone. In another place, the multitudes will greet him. That's how it still is today. When we go to Northeast India, it's amazing how you go to one village and the people are just so happy. Oh, we want to hear about Jesus. And the whole village at times will get saved. And then you go to another village and it's like, get away from us or we'll kill you. I haven't experienced that personally, but our church planners go through this all the time. It's amazing. God's timing is perfect. And so when he opens the door, we need to go through it. Well, look at verse 2. It says, Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, take note of that, he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Again, Mark and Luke's Gospels give us some additional information about this scene. Again, Matthew is writing primarily to the Jewish people, and so he's just proving that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Mark is primarily writing to the Greek or the Romans, and Mark is, you know, he 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 uses the word immediately many many times in his gospel. And so the Romans were very action-oriented. And so Mark's writing to them. So everything in Mark's gospel just it shows all these action points. Dr. Luke, he writes with a lot of medical terms, and he gives us different information because he's writing to the Greeks. They're very intellectual, very much into the, the humanity of Jesus. And so Luke uses a lot of medical terms in his gospel. But let's look at Mark's narrative real quickly here because it adds some amazing insights to what we just read. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it tells us, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Again, this is probably Peter's house there. Immediately, many gathered together. So there's Mark saying immediately. So Jesus arrives, and immediately many people are gathered together so that there is no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word, to them. So here he is in Peter's home, and it fills up very quickly with all these people, and he gives them the word of the Lord. He just starts teaching them, and there's probably, you know, hundreds of people, if not thousands, all around the house trying to cram in, trying to hear, trying to hear what's going on, waiting for him to finish so that they can, you know, be touched and maybe healed by him. As we'll see, this guy has four friends who bring him and they will lower him down to Jesus because they know this is our friend's only hope. Jesus has to touch him. Mark chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Take note of these verses. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they, they, they go up on the roof, now this house, Peter's house, and uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through... They let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And so these four guys are so determined to bring their friend to Jesus that they start just 
pulling the roof apart, you know, and it would probably be made out of, you know, dirt and, or mud and, you know, twigs and different things that they would use to cover the roof. They'd a lot of times have stone walls and then the roof would be, you know, wood frames and then they would just put stuff over it that like that. So this is, um, you know, digging a hole big enough to just to layer, lower this guy down from the ceiling right in front of Jesus. This is why Matthew says here in verse 2, notice again, when Jesus saw their faith. In other words, he sees their faith in action. He, he's just, he's probably just blown away. These guys, they know what I can do. And look at their faith. They're dropping their friend right in front of me. They truly believe that their friend's only hope was to have Jesus touch him and heal him. So what a, what a scene this is. Jesus is speaking the word. It's in a packed house. All of a sudden, you get little dirt starts falling. You know, branches, twigs start falling. And everybody stops probably and looking up. And then all of a sudden, the hole's big enough. And these guys are looking down. And then they lower their friend right down in front of Jesus. Amazing. I wouldn't doubt if Jesus looked up at them and smiled as he sees them lowering, you know, so carefully their friend right in front of him. Notice what he says here again in verse 2. Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. When Jesus said this to the paralytic, we're going to see there's a few different reactions from the people who were there. Uh, we're not told specifically what these four men that were lowering him down thought, but I'm sure the first thing in their mind was, oh, well, wait a minute, we didn't bring him here to have his sins forgiven. We brought him here so you'd touch him, heal him. He's a paralytic. We don't care about his sins being forgiven. Jesus always deals with the most important problems first. And what this guy needs, what all of us need, what we needed first was to have Jesus forgive us of our sins. That's the greatest miracle of all. So here Jesus says to him, son, be of good cheer. That phrase, be of good cheer, means be encouraged. It can also mean get excited because your, your friend's sins, they've been forgiven. Be excited. Your sins are forgiven you. As we'll see, this did not sit very well with the religious leaders who were in this house. Look at verse 3. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. Take note of these verses. Mark chapter 2 again, verses 6 and 7. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. They didn't say anything out loud. They're just reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Two very important questions. The first question is bad. The second question is good. In other words, Jesus is not blaspheming because he is, what, Emmanuel? Remember chapter 1, verse 23? You'll call him Emmanuel, God with us. So he's not blaspheming. He is God. That's why he can say this. Your sins are forgiven. Only God can forgive sins. That's the good part of their question. They know only God can forgive sins. So look at verse 4. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk. Now, I love what Jesus does here. You know, which is easier to say? You can say them both. They're pretty easy to say. It takes about the same amount of time. Your sins are forgiven you. Arise and walk. Yeah, it's easy. So which is easier to say? They're about the same. But to prove what you're saying is true, well, that's a whole different story. Anybody can say to somebody, oh, your sins are forgiven you. How would you know? You can't see it. But to say, arise to a paralytic, take up your bed and walk, wow, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where you can't fake it. They either do or they don't. So watch what Jesus does next, verse 6. But that you may know that the Son of Man, take note of that title, has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. So Jesus, first of all, tells everybody in the house, I want, to know, I want you to know who I am. And so he uses the title, the Son of Man. 
That would immediately take these scribes, these religious leaders, to Daniel, because in Daniel he uses that title for the Jewish Messiah. He calls him the Son of Man. So when Jesus says, the Son of Man, that you will know, I'm the Son of Man, and I have power, I'm tell he's saying, I am the Messiah that Daniel prophesied about. I have the power to forgive sins, because he is God with us. And to prove it, I'm going to heal this guy, and he's going to rise up. He tells him, take your bed, go to your home. And the other four gospel, or three, the other two gospels, Mark and Luke, tell us that immediately he was healed. So right then, he speaks the word, he's healed, and Jesus wants you to know this wonderful truth as well. It doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how big or how many sins you have committed. Jesus has the power, he has the authority to heal you and forgive you of all of your sins. He is the Son of Man. He is God the Son. He alone paid the price to deliver you from the bondage of sin. What was the price? His perfect spotless blood that He shed on the cross for all of us, for mankind. He alone can wash away your sins and turn you into an entirely new person. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it's a verse you know. Therefore, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, all your past, have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I can only imagine how excited this formerly paralyzed man must have been. I mean, what a night this was. He couldn't walk. He couldn't do anything. He lowered down. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. Just to prove it, you're healed. Arise, take up your bed, go home. And he jumps, I can imagine this guy, jumping up. He's probably leaping around, praising the Lord, and, and somehow works his way through the crowd. It was very similar, I think, to what we see in the, gospel, or in the book of Acts. Remember when Jesus used Peter to heal that man who has been lame, it says, for 40 years. And every day they'd carry him, lame by the beautiful gate by the temple, and here's a guy that's just begging for money, hoping to get just maybe a couple coins from Peter and John as they're going to the temple, it says. And this is what we read in Acts 3, verses 6 through 9. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. Notice, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who had sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him and as a result of that genuine miracle, all the multitude that was there, they see this. And what do they do? Oh, Peter. They try to lift him up. Oh, this guy's great. He's, he's a man of God, and we're going to worship him. And Peter says, no, no, no. I'm just a man like you guys. Don't think I did this by my own power or piety, but it was Jesus the one you crucified, the one who rose from the dead. And he uses that as an opportunity to preach the gospel. The result is 2,000 people got saved as a result of that miracle. That's why God allows miracles, simply for the result of the gospel going forth and bringing people to Jesus. So I can picture this guy here that Jesus heals doing the same thing. I'm sure he's jumping, leaping, praising the Lord for what Jesus just did for him. And all the multitudes marvel, it says there. They glorify God in verse 8 for what Christ just did for this helpless man. You know who did not marvel, who did not glorify God because of what Jesus just did? All the religious leaders. They're still stewing in their own hearts. This guy's a blasphemer. This guy's not the Son of God. We've got to find a way to get him. And that was their whole attitude the whole time Jesus was on earth. How hard-hearted were they? Well, let's keep looking. Verse 9. I love this story here. As Jesus passed on, <laughs> as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man. Notice, 
he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. Sorry. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. This is when Matthew, the writer of this gospel, gets saved. This is when he gets set free. This is when he gets delivered. This is when he follows Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, it says, Jesus saw a tax collector named Levi, the same person, Levi from the tribe of Levi. Le the Levites were to be the spiritual leaders in Israel. This guy was despised. He was despised by his parents. Nobody ever wanted their son to become a tax collector in Israel. These guys were traitors. These guys are collecting taxes for Rome, ripping off their own people. This is why the people hated tax collectors. They looked at them as the worst of sinners. Because once they got the money that Rome required for taxes, the Romans said, hey, you guys can keep whatever you want above and beyond that. So tax collectors were notorious for being cheaters, liars, thieves. They had big houses because they ripped people off, and the people knew it, and they were very upset with them. So this is how Matthew, this is his perspective of his own story. Notice he writes, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man. He didn't see a tax collector. He saw a man. He didn't see a traitor. Jesus saw a man. This is how Matthew looks at it. He saw me. He saw me, a man. He saw a man who was broken, who was filled with guilt and shame. He saw a man who was miserable and frustrated. Jesus sees a woman. He doesn't see a prostitute. He doesn't see an adulterer. He sees a woman who is broken, who is filled with guilt and shame, who is miserable, who is frustrated with life. Jesus sees a man. He doesn't see a drug addict. He doesn't see an alcoholic. He doesn't see one who is, you know, just ripping people out. He sees a man who is broken, who is lost, who is hurting. He knows that he can save that he can make you know, eternal changes in their life if they will follow Jesus. So when Jesus tells Matthew, follow me, Matthew must have instantly realized, because he's been watching Jesus in Capernaum. That was his headquarters. That's where Matthew is a tax collector, and he's seeing all the multitudes. He's probably listening in on Jesus speaking. He's seeing all the miracles. And he's probably like I was, probably like a lot of you were. God couldn't love me. God couldn't save me. Why would he want me? I did horrible things. I was wicked. I, I was ashamed to my parents. They were ashamed in themselves, but that's a whole different story. You know, but there's no way God would want me. And then when I heard the good news that Jesus died for me, he loved me, and, and he didn't see me as that person. He saw what he could do if, he, if I would just say, yes, I'll follow you, Lord. That invitation goes out to people, and you can either say, no, I'm not going to follow you, or you can say, yes, I'll follow you, and he'll do all the work. He'll change you from the inside out. Matthew's thinking, this is my chance to be free. This is my shot at redemption. This can be a new life. I can leave this old, nasty life behind. So he gets up from that tax collector's booth, and he walks away with Jesus. Watch what this change man does. Verse 10. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Luke tells us this is Matthew's house that they're all gathered in. So there's a lot of people there. Again, they had big homes. And this tells us that Matthew is so excited about what Jesus has just done for him, he invites many of his tax collector friends. He knew they were miserable because these are all Jews working for Rome, ripping off their fellow Jews, and they've got to have guilty conscience. They've got to just be miserable inside. And then he invites all these other sinners. Who are they? I don't know. doesn't tell us specifically. They're just sinners like all of us, and they're sitting there in Matthew's big house with Jesus, and they're about to share a meal with him. 
Again, this is a remarkable scene because in that culture, to eat with someone meant you are partaking in fellowship with them. You are identifying yourself with that person that you're sitting with, eating with. This is why the Pharisees would say, we'll never eat with Gentiles because you're identifying with a Gentile. You wouldn't do it as a Pharisee. They thought they were up here and the Gentiles, the rest of us are down here. I'm too good for them. Jesus is sitting with these tax collectors. He's sitting with these sinners. This explains why the Pharisees were so upset with what they're witnessing. Because Jesus is identifying with these lost, sinful, hurting people. Verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, that Jesus is sitting with them, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Again, this is an indictment against Jesus. But again, this is a beautiful testimony of his love, his grace, his compassion for lost and hopeless and helpless people like us. Jesus wants to fellowship with us. Again, when you ate with someone, you're partaking in life together. These Pharisees are thinking, this Jesus character doesn't know what God is like. Jesus is thinking, these poor Pharisees, they don't know what God is like. Because I'm God, and I'm ministering to these lost, hurting, desperate people. You poor Pharisees, if only you knew what God was like. Verse 12, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. As a great physician, he's telling these self-righteous Pharisees who thought they were perfectly fine with God, their good works are going to earn them salvation. So he's telling them, where do you guys expect me to be? I can't do anything for you, self-righteous Pharisees, because you don't even realize you're sick. You don't even realize you're lost in your sins. But I'm here to heal these sinners who know they are sick. They know they need help. That's who Jesus came for. Now, when Jesus tells them, go and learn what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You know where that's from? Jesus is quoting from the book of Hosea. Remember the book of Hosea. God tells Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. So he does. Her name was Gomer. Gomer. Make it sound a little better. I don't know. So he goes and marries Gomer. And he loves her. He takes care of her. He nurtures, nourishes her, nurtures her. I mean, he loved her. But then she runs off and she becomes a prostitute again. And while she's out there, she gets sold as a prostitute. I mean, she is as low as you can get, beaten down by the world, beaten down by all these men she's with. And God tells him, go and buy her back. That's mercy. That's grace. Learn what that means, he's telling these Pharisees. So he go goes and buys her back, brings her home. And she's just beaten down. She just worked over. And he loves her. He nourishes her. And then God tells Hosea, now you're ready to prophesy to the children of Israel for me. It was all an illustration of what Israel, the people of Israel, were doing to God. They were playing the harlot. God loved them. He did everything for them. And yet they continued to run off, worship Baal, worship Ashtoreth, worship all these pagan gods. And God loved them and wanted them to come back. And that was his heart towards them. Repent, turn back to the Lord. This is why Jesus tells these Pharisees, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus wanted these religious people to quit looking down on the lost, hurting, sinful people, stop judging them, stop condemning them, start seeing them as people who need God's love and mercy. That's how God wants all of us to see the lost people around us with love and compassion. I know our CARES team were at the park today, you know, feeding the homeless, trying to minister to them. Those are the people that need Jesus. 
If you think, well, they're just getting what they deserve, then you have the heart of a Pharisee. Jesus wants us to reach out. We think, oh man, that border crisis, look at all these you know, people from South America coming over. It's illegal. Yes, I agree. You know, Pastor Chuck used to say back in the 70s, when all the people from Vietnam, as soon as the Vietnam War ended, all these Vietnamese, and I was there in San Diego, all the Vietnamese show up, people from Laos, Cambodia, and a lot of people are like, man, we don't want all these people from Asia here. Pastor Chuck had such an attitude. It was so awesome because he said, you know what? We can't go to those countries. A lot of them are closed, but God's bringing the people here. Let's witness to them. Let's reach out to them. Let's proclaim the gospel to them. When, you know, at, at one point, they had 75 home fellowships at Calvary Chapel and Costa Mesa. Half of those were foreign languages to foreign people from all over the world. It was amazing how many people had come to Christ simply because he had an attitude. I don't want to kick him out. I want to just, God's bringing him here for a reason. We want to see it legally and all that stuff. Yeah, but our government's corrupt. They're doing things wicked, but find the right side of the silver lining. Whoever he brings into your path, give them the good news of Jesus Christ. That's how God wants us to see those who are lost around us. Love them enough to bring them to the great physician so that Jesus can heal their broken hearts, save their lost souls, wash away all of their sins. And here's this tax collector trader Matthew saying he saw a man. He saw me. And if Jesus can do that for me, and I'm saying this personally, if he can save me, he can save anybody. That's what God desires from each of us. We are His hands. We are His feet. We have the cure for sin, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. This is why the gospel is so important. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Verse 16. <clears throat> Get it out. Romans 1, 16, where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who will believe, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. So with that in mind... This would be a great time to take communion together with all of our fellow sinners who are saved by God's glorious grace. Again, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. Against God, against His Holy Word, Jesus died for you. He shed His blood for you. He's not ashamed to be identified with you. Isn't that amazing? The Creator of the heavens and the earth loves you and is wanting to be identified with you. And here he is with all these sinners, tax collectors, in Matthew's house. And you know what they did? They usually, the way they'd have a meal, they'd have a big bowl of soup, stew. They'd have a big loaf of bread. And they would pass the bread around. They'd rip off a chunk of that bread, pass it around. They'd rip off a chunk of the bread all the way around the table. Everyone would dip into that pot of soup, eat it, double dip. It was okay back then probably triple dip, and they're eating from that. That's why the Pharisees said, I'll never eat with a Gentile. I'm not going to dip in there with them. Because in their thought, this is that Middle Eastern thought, is the same nutrients from that soup and bread that are going into my body, it's going into this person's body, that, that all the way around the table, and that joins us together as one. So that's why Jesus was there. Can you picture Jesus around that table with these guys, all these sinners, tax collectors? He's got soup dripping down his beard, breadcrumbs on his face, and he's just enjoying fellowship, leading them to salvation. Amazing. Don't ever think that Jesus is ashamed of you. No, he came to die for you. He loves you. If you don't know the Lord, before we take communion, now would be an awesome time to turn your life over to Jesus. Start following Him. The Bible says if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And then we partake together, and you're part of the family of God.